It really is a pleasure seeing so many of you here tonight on a cold winter's night. We appreciate your coming. Tonight's program is called the Shrewsbury Farmers and Mechanics Club. Linda Davis is our presenter. The program will explore the Shrewsbury Farmers and Mechanics Club, which was the name of an organization right here in Shrewsbury, and the role that it played in our community. Linda is a lifelong resident of Shrewsbury, and she's been curator of the Shrewsbury Historical Society for the past 15 years. She also serves on the Historic Commission. Linda. Okay. Don't forget the light. <laughs> I'm to put my eyes on so we can see. Um, I know some people may think this is kind of like a, a dry sort of discussion, and but it was like an extremely important part of this town. Agriculture was a leading industry of Shrewsbury from way back in the beginning. And I'm going to give you a little information here that was actually out of the Atlas of Worcester County, dated in 1889. So some of this information may seem like it's off, but it's only off because it was written in 1889. So um, it said that, it says in here that according to tradition um, and information from grandfathers of living men in town, it talks about a period of over 100 years that most of the lands now were in use for pasture and for agricultural use. It was cleared of wood before the Revolutionary War. So we already had some open land before the Revolutionary War even started. Um, it states, remember, we're in 1889. Um, in the earliest times, meadows without any improvement or any kind of tilling produced a very coarse grass. But it was still considered very valuable, and the farmers often had several acres of this valuable me meadow. Um, it was actually kind of remote from their actual farm locations. The meadows were generally free of the wood and free from large trees, and uh, they had um, the quantity of meadow was much increased, and a much better kind of hay was produced by bringing the water into the area by ditches upon the uplands. Um, it says, but, but, let's see, but in the 1800s, early 1800s, it was discovered by Shrewsbury farmers that there was a market in Boston for butter, cheese, eggs, chickens, veal, and pork, and beef on the hoof. Um, up to that point, most of it was, it was very important that the families were taken care of. So most of these small farms and even the larger farms, it was families that were the large consumption. And anything that was left over was usually sold within the town and the town people. Um, they, from, from the time, you know, you're talking moving forward, it basically the time moving forward, farming began to improve. And farmers were finding better methods of, cat, you know, working with cattle and crops and, you know, they, a lot of the crops were rye and oats, Indian cons, and hay. We also were very well known for our apple orchards in town. Yeah. We had many, many apple orchards. And um, it says apple trees were planted at the very early onset. And before 1776, nearly every farm had an orchard. And if good fruit was abundant, there was no lack of cider. And that was very important back then. It says about 1820, market wagons began to run regularly every week from Shrewsbury to Boston. And then they would return, and they would bring stuff back from Boston to the town. They hauled all kinds of groceries, dry goods, and it continued until about 1845. And after that, it was found that the town of Worcester was actually a better market. Worcester was growing, and the population needed more types of products like Shoesby was doing. So it saved the farmers the expense and the time going into Boston. Um, and let's see. And so everybody could be their own market man and so put in their own pocket the commissions on sales. Uh, okay, let me go to this next page. <laughs> okay, now the Farmers, the farmers, farmers and Mechanics Club um, there was small groups of 
farming clubs in the early 1800s. But in 1860, on February 14th, they formed what was considered the Shrewsbury Farmers and Mechanics Club. The purpose of this was for promoting the best methods of farming. And the club held occasional meetings, mostly in the winter, <coughs> like say September to like April. And they would discuss all kinds of agricultural topics, which we will get to eventually. They were also became very well known for their um, cattle shows, their agricultural fairs. They did a lot to help the town and they just became a huge group. And in, let's see, eventually as Shrewsbury, as the time, as years went on, we formed, kind of merged with Worcester. So it became known as the Worcester Agricultural Society. And I said, I found as I transcribed all these notes, this book that's sitting in front of you is the notes from about three years of meetings. The secretary took all these notes and I read them all first. And then I said, oh, I have to transcribe these because they're rather entertaining. So I said, I found that I smiled quite a few times during reading these things in reference to conversations that were taking, taken up at all these different meetings. And they would call them the topic of consideration. So when they would meet for one meeting, they would discuss a topic, and then they would pick a topic for the next meeting. And a, a lot of times, we had, well, we had the same similar situation that we have since the beginning of time. There were the gentlemen farmers, the people who were well, much better off, bigger amounts of acreage, had more money to work with. And we had the small farmers. Uh, just for a second, I just want you to like kind of clear your mind and just think, go back to 1860 in your head, all right? Get rid of cell phones and instant gratification, get rid of grocery stores, you know, get rid of, you know, going to Macy's and having 60 dresses to pick from, three dozen, dr d you know, dress suits, you know, that kind of stuff, because by Putting yourself kind of back, if you can get your mind back there a little bit, I think you'll find that some of these meetings were actually very necessary and very interesting. Um, the, a lot of the gentlemen farmers would lease fields to a smaller farmer. So if they didn't have the acreage and they needed grasses or oats or something to feed their animals, they would lease a section of a field. And they would recycle, they learned, as time went on, they, I mean, they knew earlier, but as, as more information became available and more discussions in these groups, they were self-aware and well-educated in the fact that sometimes these fields had to lay low. They had to be allowed to enrich themselves and rebring back minerals and natural things in order to produce the food properly. So these were some of the things that were discussed through this club. And um, the farming was basically the health of this town. Without the farmers and without their agricultural knowledge, it would have been a lot harder for people to get by. And of course, like I say, since ancient times, we've had the have and the have-nots and those who are able to you know, be more flexible with what they have for knowledge and money and things like that. Early farmers had very large families and there was reasons for it. Um, if, a, if, if a family had 12 kids, say, maybe half of their children would not live to adulthood. And these families needed these large families in order to operate these, these farms, in order to make these farms profitable and to be able to feed their families and to be able to share with the town extras and things like that. And the school seasons for these children worked around the sowing and the harvesting of their fields. <coughs> so early schools would be in winter and sometimes summer because 
they were needed on the farm to be able to put these seeds in, and they were needed back in the farm in order to harvest. And I always smile because, you know, like, if you go back in your head now, you know, we say, oh, we're going we're gonna to be green. Well, we're going green. We're going green. Don't send my statement in the mail. I'll get it online. And you print it out anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we have no idea in this day and age what green even means. We have no clue. Throwing a few bottles in a you know, blue bucket or a green bucket, these people knew green. And they recycled everything. And it was very important that their seeds were recycled, so to speak. And their grasses were recycled. I mean, everything was recycled. Gun pots. Take one barn down, build another barn with the same wood, add a couple of new pieces. Clothing. It was reworked. It was handed down. It was made into quilts. So green today, getting your statement online, those are just, <coughs> you know, that this is green, what they're doing. This is green. And they also were very, it was very important. They, they had a very tight social network with the town in general. They shared all kinds of information. They were involved in all kinds of things in the town. I mean, there was no TVs, there was no radio. So all these groups like the Mechanics Club, I mean, there were temperance clubs, there were debate clubs, there were literary clubs. They all shared together in a town. It was a community. And without each other, the community fell apart. So they were not lost in news. They had communication. They knew what was going on in the world. They, they were able to keep up with everything else that was going on. But they were still a community. I mean, when you think back to 1860, we had probably a population of about 1,600 people in this town. I mean, without each other, the town doesn't move forward. And the other thing that was a major part of, of um, the Mechanics Club was the poor farm. They were very, very good at helping teach the people at the poor farm because that was another self entity. You know, they grew their own foods and they worked their own farms. And, and uh, so, you know, the club was really you know, very involved in, in that type of thing, too. So, so um, like I say, the organization was put together on February 14th of 1860, and a lot of the information I'll present tonight is straight from these record books. And this book starts around February 6th of 1871. The beginning of the book starts with the club's constitution, its bylaws, and the members of the club at the beginning of 1871. At the time that this book begins, George Harlow was the president, Samuel Ward and Simon Allen were vice presidents. Um, I'm not sure how you say this guy's name, Aru Aruna, Aruna Harlow. He was the treasurer. Thomas Ward, Sam Ward, they were also chosen. But their job was rather unique in the beginning of this book. Their job was to take care of the club's crockery, glassware, and the tables. <laughs> so I'll give you some of the names. I know you guys are going to recognize these names. This <coughs> pages and pages of names. So I picked out ones that I knew that if I said them, you guys are going to go, oh, yeah. Um, we had lots of Allens. We had Brigham's. We had John Bullock. We had Chapins, we had Carpenters, we had Charles Green, we had George Hollow, we had Jacob Hapgood, we had Levi Hemingway and Alvin Henshaw, we had Howes, we had Knowltons, George Perry, we had Plimptons, Prentices, Rices, Thomas Ward, William Hollow, Josiah Stone, Wheelocks, Oliver Wyman, William Maynard, the Winchesters, the Norses. We had also Abel Perry, who was connected with George. We had Temples. We had William Rich. We also, evidently, 
from the way these are written is that we had allowed people coming in from different towns. So we have a list here back when it starts, it starts around the beginning of 1872 where there's a whole list of names, but then it will say Boylston or Northboro or Westboro. So they must have been people that they connected with or people that they, they traded with and bartered with or sold to or bought from. And they were allowed to join, you know, the group. Um, yeah. So a lot of those names you're going to recognize as more, you know, more affluent people in town in general and being gentlemen farmers. Now, the, uh, the book starts, it's written... It's written like all of our meeting minutes are, even to this day, you know. It says, this record book, you know, does this. and that. So the, it says here, from the book of the farm, I've got here, from the book of the Farmers Club, Shrewsbury, Massachusetts. It's written right in the front, organized February 14th of 1860. This record book that we have in our archives here starts around February 6th of 1871, and it appears that a Harrington was the owner of this book. Now, there were Harringtons involved in the group, but in the beginning, it says Harrington in it, handwritten. So I'm going to take the assumption that somewhere along the line, one of the Harringtons, um, uh, you know, got a hold of the book. And like I say, the beginning of the book starts with the, the, with the group's const constitution, its bylaws, its members. The first entry made is February 6th of 1871. It says that the Shrewsbury Farmers Club met at the house of Captain Jesse Perry. I'll move one of these so you, I only have a few slides, so give you an idea of what some of these <coughs> big farms look like. This was the Walker Farm, and that was on Boylston Circle. So you can see how huge the farm is. So someone like this man would maybe have leased some of his property to other smaller farmers. So the first meeting was held at Captain Jesse Perry's. And at this time, they were choosing their new president, their vice presidents, their secretaries, and their treasurers. So we had Hollows, Wards, and Allens. And they vote, they do read their, their uh, meeting minutes. And in the beginning here, they're talking about voting to have an agricultural exhibit next fall. So these first couple of things are mostly about them getting together and deciding how to form up committees, who's going to be responsible for what in order to make this exhibit a success. So they had um, committees that were just involved in farmers, I mean the farmers supper. They were very, knowledge they had lots of farmers suppers and they would use their products from, the other, from everybody's farm. So if you had a meal, you might have Wyman's beans and you might have Ward's onions or you might, you know. So they had these quite often and at the time, these, the wives were included in these. So it says, voted that these gentlemen with their wives constitute a committee. And then it says they voted also to have a course of lectures in the coming winter. Voted that they get up a supper by buying everything necessary, make the tickets cover the cost. Voted to have the supper cold. Next meeting will be at S.W. Howe's. The topic of consideration is the best mode of curing hay. So on February 13th, they met at Mr. Howe's house. They read their minute meetings. They discussed a little bit more about their farmer's um, ex ex exhibition and a little bit more about their farmer's supper. And then they came to the topic of consideration, best mode of curing hay. Now, the way it's written is there are remarks, so like in any group, if you say something, or I say something, or you say something, it says who made the remarks. So in this particular case, I'll just go over a few of them, things that I found interesting. The remarks of Captain J. Perry. He was the first to called upon to speak. He said that the time to cut clover was when it was in blossom. He would also cut 
grass when it was in blossom. Foul meadow and blue joint he would let stand until it had seeded for the benefit of the meadows. Now, mind you, I had to look up some of these things because <laughs> I had no idea what some of these things were. Remarks of Mr. Walker, he thought that hay was often injured by drying too much. William Howe thought that farmers did not generally begin to hay early enough. Mr. Thomas Ward referred to an essay that he read at the read before the Board of Agriculture, giving the idea that it was best to cut, cure, and get hay in the same day, and that farmers should begin to cut their, their grass as early as the 15th of June. Addison Lovell said that, he, that whether hay should be dried one day or two depended very much upon the season of the year. Oliver Wyman said he was in favor of cutting grass all very early. Joe, uh, Jay Prentice said he thought it was a danger in drying the hay too much. So that's a general idea of what each meeting was. So they, they closed the meeting. The remarks were made by several other gentlemen. Topics selected for the next meeting was breeding of stock. The meeting was adjourned to meet at T.W. Ward Esquire next Monday evening. On February 20th, they met and they discussed breeding of stock. And it says that T.W. Ward was the first to aim of the farmer should get the stock adaptable to his farm. He said it was not wise to raise calf or cattle that was not fit and did not fit directly and comfortably into the farm situation that they were operating. Mr. Lovell said that he thought it was equally important to have the male as well as the female from good stock. <laughs> Coe said that every man should select stock, stock adapted to his farm and his farm only. Walker thought that stock to be bred should be matured by age. He would have a bull three years old and a cow to breed who was four. So they were obviously sharing animals as well. At the meet, and they adjourned. They met at Joe Prentice, I mean John Prentice's house in, on Monday, and they also continued discussing this same topic. They said it was good to get good milkers because we must raise on. Once again, they're back to the good stock. Said to have good good milkers, we must raise from good stock on both sides. Um, Raising calves from good cows and preferring that bulls were at least two years old. They could make 17 to 20 sheep with a $300 profit a year. So all these things that they're saying is that just in the beginning here, we're making sure that in Shrewsbury, we are working with the best grains that are adaptable to our climates, adaptable to the animals that we, ha that we have here in town. And they, they are working on a, a system so that um, all these people are working together to make these farms successful. Now there's my friend hanging over there. He's one of my favorite things in this museum, so. And that would be um, one of the tractors. Now, you've got to remember that in the 1700s, they were doing all this by hand. And it wasn't until mid-1800s that we started having some kind of equipment to help mow down the hay and put things together. So, so that meeting adjourned. And this next meeting, they're going to see what seeds we should plant and sow, how, when, and shall we do it. So the next group that got together, they got, had a special meeting to discuss their annual dinner and their exhibition. And they had, um, they had a meeting on March 13th of 1871 with wives, daughters, and other friends. And they had, the evening was a social event, a social conversation and, in, and partaking in refreshments. So in this case, we didn't have any worries about seeds or cows or grasses. And it says the president responded by thanking the club, Nathan Walker, whose farm we just saw, 
presented to the president a valuable new pair of boots. So in the on the 20th of 1871, they met at George Hollow's house, and they started discussions about seeds, how to sow, when they should do it. George Hollow opened the discussion by saying that as making milk was an important part of a branch of farming, he thought it desirable to raise grasses and crops that would help most in that direction. He would ask to improve the grass crop, crop for hay. He would also raise certain other grains for fodder for the stock. Um, he thought that the early rose, which was a potato, I found out, um, was a good, a good substance to grow, and that they needed to investigate all different kinds of grasses that would do well in our New England climate. It said that uh, they also agreed that the relation to the grass crop was very important. They believed it was important in how they raised their stock and the health and well-being of their stock. Some said that they would feed term turn turnips to cows that gave milk, but others said no, no turnips for their cows. Um, some thought that mangolds and sugar beets were the best roots to raise. Carrots, he one said, none of us could raise and make them pay. So not only were they concerned about making sure that they had the best seeds and the best produce and crop growing for, uh, for the New England area for their animals that they kept on there, but they were also concerned about their pocketbooks. And if something wasn't going to make them any money, then they moved on to trying to find other things that would give them a profit. So not only are they concerned about their welfare as far as what they're growing and what they're keeping for animals, but they're worried about their pocketbook just like we all are today. <coughs> William Maynard said he was in favor of raising all the clover he could. He also said that he would sow oats and would cut them for fodder. Captain Hapgood exhibited specimens of a seed corn. It was very nice. And made some remarks showing how he could tell something in relation to the number of bushels that could be raised per acre by looking at this corn. They adjourned the meeting and they met again, but their next topic was just farming in general. They met at George Rogers' house. They voted to have a strawberry festival during the season of strawberries. The topic of consideration was farming in general. The president spoke of the importance of having the best seeds for their crops. Members of the cro clubs should try experiments by raising different crops and comparing them with each other, not only for their value, but for their profit. Farmers should keep an exact account of the cost of cultivating their fields and also of the profit for each field. It would give us a better idea of what we are doing. So they're, they're experimenting, they're expanding, and they're still making sure that the seeds and the things that they're putting in the ground is gonna benefit them as farmers and as citizens of the town and as their pocketbook needs. Um, Howe spoke of the foul seed he purchased. He was very unhappy with it. The grass seed and the foul seed that he bought was not good and it did not pay well and he could not do anything with it. He thought something ought to be done to prevent the men who buy and sell our produce from getting so much of the profit or selling seeds and products that are not up to par. Uh, let's see, Captain Hapgood also said that farmers should raise their own seeds for grass. So now we're like, we're having problems with the seed people. So now they're looking at the angle of, all right, we're gonna let our grass come to seed, we're going to collect the seeds, then we will cut the grass. And we will dry the seeds because we had a good crop this year. So maybe we'll have a good one next year. Um, uh, Mr. Lovell said he was of the opinion that, if we ra that we raise better of our own seed and that the haze will be very good, 
after it. Our crops, by using the best seed, as like produces, he thought the early rose potato was good. He thought selecting ears of corn from the field would also produce seeds that would produce better crops. They were meeting at Captain Perry's next. This was basically to have all the arrangements for the Strawberry Festival done. They still continued on the topic of their, their regular farming in general. Farmers could cultivate as half as much ground and apply double the manure to their ground. That way they could make more money. He also thought it might improve the apparent, they, he also thought that they might be able to make their farms more attractive by improving the appearance of their farms, very much by setting out shade trees on the roadside. Mr. Howe said that for all kinds of corns, he would only plant rows of four feet apart. So they're also discussing not putting things too close and all that stuff. So um, in, a in August, they got together and started planning one of their agricultural exhibitions. And these were big events. So they had, all, once again, we had all kinds of committees and we had to make arrangements for what we were going to charge, what they were going to offer for food, how they were going to get people in here with their animals. They offered premiums for winning any of the, uh, you know, for those that won for cattle and things like that. They also went through all this time, the matter of purchasing fruit dishes, fixing dinner ticket prices, setting hours, um, land to be obtained for the plowing and for the trials of the working oxen. And they were huge events. Now, that big thing there, I think that one's 1873, actually, no, 1876, actually. So that was a few years after these, these minutes. Um, they, had a, a disc, they had to bring in the Shrewsbury Band. The Shrewsbury Band was always there. And it said that they wanted to know um, at one of the next meetings, or in between their planning of their exhibition, they wanted to know what could make the club more useful, not only to each other, but to the town itself. And it said that this, they spoke that the club had done and was doing, and how its small beginnings, and how it's risen since that beginning. It's risen to be a large, influential institution and thought it owned its success in part to the harmony and good feelings between its members having our annual shows and gatherings from time to time. So they were working at forming their own and forming with town. Captain, Berry, Captain Perry thought the group could and has been very much benefited by these meetings, discussions on all different subjects presented. One, he thought that none of them were too old to learn. <laughs> Mr. Cobb thought it would be harmonious, but it was impossible to think alike on all the same subjects. But they were united as a club, and he felt that everyone benefited by attending meetings. It said it could, be, uh, it could make its influence felt in every department of the town and in the social relations <coughs> of life. But to accomplish that end, they must be reunited. They must have pers no personal ill feelings <coughs> towards anyone. We could be a model town by having the best stock, setting trees, this is where their priorities are, having best stock setting trees by the roadside, improving the roads, getting the best seeds that could be found, and using good cultivation. By doing so, we can make the town attractive and that it could induce others to come and settle among us. When we are gone, we should leave good behind us. So, and Mr. Howe spoke of the first formation of the club, its rise and progress, spoke of the club's suppers and what benefit it had received from such gatherings, was doing so much to unite the town, and soon the club would be the town who all, who all would be members and can do work they undertake together and as a unity. We had a topic coming up that was raising and keeping poultry and making it profitable.
They also had the, a meeting where it said what were the most profitable crops they could raise. There was a variety of crops that farmers attempted to raise, and of these, Mr. Ward made some statements of profits of an acre of corn or oats or grass, making more than paying for the cultivation of cost and corn. Howe thought that farmers made something, that their, farmer, their fathers were making money on farming, and they reared up large families and gained properly and must have gained something from doing the work. So I guess what the, the problem was is that the, as time was getting on, that we were becoming more accessible to things. So they were trying to decide if farming was becoming less profitable. They had a meeting on the best method of raising and disposing of milk. Now this is the Wyman farm. This was a huge farm. And we remember he was a member of the club. So um, they talked about milk. The first thing was to make sure they had warm, dry places for their cows, have suitable food for them to eat. They liked clover. They liked good hay. In order to have good milk, you needed those things. Jeffrey Perry said he always made, a, made butter from his cow's milk. He found that the butter sold better than the milk. Um, Mr. Cobb said he fed turnips to his cows with some meal on them. And no, because one, one person in here complained that he would not feed turnips to his cows because he thought that it would spoil the milk and butter. Mm -hmm. Mr. Cobb says he feeds turnips to his cows all the time and there has been no complaint about his milk. Let's see. Um, Jesse Perry thought farming would pay if attended as well as any other business. His father raised corn, wheat, oats, barley, and made it pay. But he thought now farming had changed and a different mode should be adopted, growing such crops as would not take much labor and take, uh, to take care of. Grass, he thought, was one of the best crops a farmer could grow. It was definitely needed by everybody. And he said one thing which I thought was very important. He said, farming is a business. We need to make money. We need to move forward. But being a farmer makes us generally healthier than people that are confined indoors. <laughs> Mr. Allen confirmed the opinions, saying that farming had not really paid off for him over the past year, but his health has been wonderful. <laughs> Mr. Green said that he had not made very well in his farming, but he thought that money could be made if more direct and right management is used. So that means that maybe for a while there wasn't a lot of really good management. You know, I mean, the bigger farmers, I'm sure, you know, were fine with that. But, um, you know, maybe they weren't managing their accounts as well or keeping as good a track so that by doing better accounting, they would find that they would, would maybe make more money. And then one of the topics of conversation, now we're in 1872, was does farming pay? How thought farming could pay? According to the scripture, he that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread. He thought farming paid in health and enjoyment. Um, so even though farming was making changes and it wasn't maybe producing the profits that were there, I think it once a farmer, always a farmer. And they found that it, it benefited highly in their health and their welfare, their family. This was a dairy farm. We did have a lot of dairies. There wasn't a lot in here on dairy farming, which I thought was interesting. But we did have a lot of dairy farms. But in order to have good milk and good butter and a good dairy farm, you had to make sure that you knew what grains and grasses and things to feed your animals. So in, in uh, March of 1872, they had a meeting on how to rid themselves of insects that destroy our crops. Like I say, you know, when, you, when you're reading this thing, you kind of chuckle because you sit there and you go, they had a whole meeting on these things? 
But when you, like I say, when you, if you can go back in your mind, these things were really important. I mean, nowadays we just infect the atmosphere and environment with pesticide, pesticides and we just spray this and we do that. They didn't have that available to them. So they had to come up with ways to avoid these bugs from coming in and destroying full field crops of, of, their, uh, of what was going to pay them, what their profit was. So George Rogers said in relation to canker worms that had been a question with him, he, would, um, he was using some kind of manure of some sort, hoping that it would kill the canker worm. He said that we might perhaps as well let them work and then try to use the seeds and save the seeds. He how thought that the best way to kill the apple worm was to turn hogs into the orchard and let them pick the apples and get them get the bugs out of those apples that are laying around. Mr. Johnson thought the best way to kill a potato bug was to put a hen and chicken among them. Mr. Jenkins thought to keep the bugs out of his squashes, he was planting hen manure. Mr. Walker said the best way to destroy the cut bugs was to plow the ground in the fall. Cobb said he puts ashes around his, his um, crops, and that keeps the boars away. Mr. Maynard thought he could kill those same boars by using a piece of whalebone and ferret them out. Um, they had, a, the next topic was on seeds that we plant and sow. We're back to the seeds again. Mr. Walker thought the silver, on, silver skin onions were the best to raise. But he would also sow java wheat rather than oats and barley. For corn, he would do a kind, small eight-road corn. He would also raise carrots and the long red mangolds. He said he had also been very successful in raising cabbage and intended in the coming year to plant an acre of potatoes, cabbages, mangold, and turnips. He would also like to plant more corn, sow more oats, and java wheat. So Mr. Walker had that big farm that we looked at. So he had lots of acreage to play with. Um, Mr. Maynard would sow four road barley rather than two road. Mr. Newton said he had seen some of Brooks seedling. It was the largest and nicest looking potatoes he had ever seen and they were said to be very good eating potatoes. Then we had the manure, the manure co topic for consideration and like I say I had to admit I did chuckle through all of this but it was very important. Once again there were no fertilizers. And I mean, look what the fertilizers have done to this country. We have algae blooms in the lakes, the, the, the Great Lakes, because all this fertilizer is pouring off these people's fields and making these algae blooms and, and the Mississippi Delta with all these things going, because all this stuff that we use is pouring in. Everything they used was natural. It may sound weird when you say, well, they mix things with plaster and, you know, but that's what they did. So they discussed a little bit on, on manure. Mr. Newton said he likes to spread manure on his grassland, plow it under, and then spread the inverted sod and put compost made of hen manure in the hills. Captain Jesse Perry thought there was no better manure than that made from cattle and horses, and that it worked best when it was mixed well. He said he also thought one barrel of hen manure to mix with loom or plaster was worth as much as a load of bond manure. manure. He would plant and spread his manure and then mix and prepare the hen manure and put it in his hills. So, like I say, you know, you, you sit there and you go, I mean, Mr. Dickerson says valuable manure might be made by mixing salts and plasters along with the manures. So, you know, it's, like I say, you know, you, 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 if you can get your brain back to that, that time period, you know, it's, it's a little bit easier to kind of understand um, what's going on. Um, one of the main members of the Shrewsbury Farmers Club was J.H. Was Nelson Esquire. Now, he is out in our cemetery, and he passed away. 
So several meetings were just put together to make arrangements for attending and decorating for the funeral of their club member, J.H. Nelson. They had um, committees put together so that they could do different things. On motion of Mr. Mr. S.D. Ward, it was voted to decorate the church in mourning and have other arrangements made by the club that may see fit to do his best respect to his memory. So we have several pages of that. So that must have been a big loss to them because and once again, we're in 1872, we're planning another agricultural exhibit. So we have lots of meeting members and whatnot. And once again, we have the same things. The records are read and the votes are made on who should draw premiums for working cattle, <coughs> who should do what with, the tri with a trial with teams of, of oxen, horses, where to have the dinner, lower hall, procure cots, filling them for drawing and backing, flags, bands, and this time we're, lo we're looking for local peddlers. So they must have been having like a little uh, vendor display. And this is all about, the, the, these pages are all, but they had in the, in the exhibitions, they had entries for plowing, <coughs> drawing and backing, working steers, draft horses, thoroughbred bulls. They had grade bulls, thoroughbred cows and heifers, grade and native cows. Now, I don't know who, what all these things are, but they're obviously all different breeds of animals that were here in town. They had milch heifers. They had regular heifers. They had herds of cows and fat cattle. They had family horses and stallions, mares and colts, sheep, swine, poultry, and even some dogs. They also had the women were involved in these, so there were um, there were butters and cheeses and pies and handiwork and so these were big big deals and um, so that you know I mean they went in and they talked some more about um, milks farming today compared to 20 years ago Johnson said there was a big difference in between his farming now and 20 years ago he was differently situated. He said he thought the milk business was the best for the farmers now. Mr. Maynard said the old Dutch plow and tools of that day had gone by, but improvements in tools have enabled us to do our work easier and better than formerly, though labor costs now were a little bit more than they were then. He thinks farmers years ago plowed their ground to shallow. He thinks the value of the hay and crop has increased threefold within 20 years. So we're moving forward just in these few years of this book into actually using more than just that one plow that we have a, cop, a, a sample of upstairs. Um, now near the end of the meeting uh, minutes is something I thought was like really kind of interesting. The topic of consideration at the next meeting is do the best interests of the town of Shrewsbury require that we should dispose our present farm or build suitable buildings for an alms house therein? So basically, there was, I don't know what it was because they don't go into that, but there was some kind of an issue between the town people, the members, the selectmen and not whatnot, and the farmers as to what to do with the poor. And the farmers club, had been helping support, helping teach and train these people to be able to be self-sufficient. But the town evidently is not on board with this. So I don't know what the whole thing is about, but it says basically this was a two, two or three night or two or three meeting discussion. Um, Mr. Ward was asked, was called upon to speak and responded by saying that the subject before the club was one of unusual importance, interest and to the moral credit of the town, as well as to the comfort and well-being of those who are called to participate in the good or evil that may, re may result from the sale of the farm on which the town buildings were recently burned. So I'm taking the assumption somewhere along the line that the town had made decisions to either move the poor farm or do something different, and they had burned the buildings. 
Um, the future well-being of the town is in the hands and at the disposal in a great measure of the present native population. Who says, shall we build up or shall we pull down? Shall we sustain laudable efforts of those who have the eagerness endeavored to build the place up, or should we turn our backs and close our ears to the call of industry, good taste? Should we let decency perish by the way? Our own acts will answer and settle this question. Let us candidly and coolly consider before we take final steps. So evidently they're being dragged into this whole thing. And it says here that the farm was purchased in 1828 and had been occupied and used to support the town poor since that time. Its location has not been interrupted and remains the same as it ever will. So basically, this discussion is being brought about by should they just ignore the, the farm or should they rebuild it? And the general consensus through these people was that it should be rebuilt and it should be built on the same location because the farm was a good farm. It produced good crops. And like I say, there's pages of this. So this was a testy, a testy um, subject. But it said that they were called upon to speak, responding by saying the subject before the club was, was, was very important. Um, the, the town was in favor of selling the farm. It may be said that there is the land only, no buildings, that is true. But for the use of the town, it's been made and calculated that the burning of the buildings on the town farm, that new buildings should be erected in the place of the old ones. And it says, George Stone, when he first looked upon the ruins of the town farm after the fire, made up his mind that it was best to rebuild there again. He said he did not believe that there was a house in town suitable for a proper, proper establishment. He thought it would be best for the best economy of the town to build something convenient and suitable on the same location for an establishment which is much needed. He thinks it would honor the town to have a suitable building put up. He thinks it's a the town has lost credit by the course it is taking. He said he was opposed of selling the farm in any part. Captain Perry said he thought it was not generally known how great improvements have been made on the town farm. He felt that more improvements could be made, and he was not in favor of selling the farm after having expended so many efforts in it and keeping the people self-sufficient. Um, George Rogers gave his views on the topic and said that he was very troubled at the course taken by the town in relation to their town farm. He said he was very much in favor of building the old farm built up again and thought it would be a credit to the town to do so. Mr. Walker said the town had better build on the old farm and that it would have been better to build immediately after the fire and not sit around waiting. He thinks it would be a loss to the town to sell their farm after expending so much on improvements and he thinks once again too the town has lost credit. So it was, it was interesting that we went from discussing seeds and manures and whatnot to something that was pretty critical that they were now taking control into. So you knew, you knew that by 1873 that they were still involved in making sure they were protecting their own rights and protecting their pocketbooks and producing the best produce, but that they were now becoming even more socially involved in the town and where it was going. Um, one of, I won't go through all this because it's way too long, but the sixth annual fair of the Shrewsbury Farmers Club was in October 9th of 1873. It said autumn has spread its brightest colors over the maples of Shrewsbury and the warm sun of October dawned pleasantly for the annual gala. A good day for the township. The fair began at nine o'clock with plowing Fun day was, at ha was had for all. The day began with the appearance of the antiques, a crowd in Motley who did not belie their name nor their t other title, the Horribles. So we had parades. Later in the afternoon, the Shrewsbury Brass Band came out, the exhibition hall in the town hall, 
There was numbers of articles. There was a center of the hall was occupied by fancy needlework, pretty pictures, dishes, flowers, varieties of all kinds of flowers in stands and bouquets, sewing machines, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> At the sides of the hall stretched all kinds of tables covered with all kinds of vegetables and roots. Two long tables, one covered with apples, another with pears, all ranged down the hall. Apples of every shade, red, yellow, and green, filled about 175 plates, representing 21 orchards. The cattle show was held at the upper part of the back of the church, and it was a good exhibition of all the different animals. So it was cows and the fat oxen. So yes, yeah, so they basically it covered herds of cows, cattle, horses, sheep, poultry, um, butter, breads, root crops, grain crops, vegetables, fruits, works of art, penmanship, drawing, watercolors, manu some manufactured uh, um, articles like the domestic sewing machine, saving washing machine, flowers. One lady won for the best dish of pansies. But it's, like I say, it seemed like after a while, like I say, the things weren't becoming as profitable. And it says, but times in recent years, now remember, we're still back in 1889, but times in recent years with the farm, Shrewsbury Farmer has greatly changed. And there is but one far, farm product in respect to which he is not obligated to compete with the producers all around the state. On account of its quickly perishable nature, milk, which is in demand the year round, is in no danger of remote competition. So we're seeing that these farms that were doing crops and cattle and all these stuff, now we've gone a little bit more towards where the competition is not. So Shrewsbury's becoming more of a dairy farming area. Um, it says, uh, except for milk and possibly apples, of which there are great quantities in Shrewsbury, um, it is supposed that there is any other farm pro I do not suppose there is any other farm product of sufficient amount to supply more than a home market now. In recent years, and this was, now it's interesting because, you know, we don't have any land in town anymore. So, so in 1889, it says, in recent years, the saleable value of farmlands in Shrewsbury has been steadily diminishing. And in fact, they cannot be sold at all. Nobody will buy and many want to sell. There is not probably a farm in town that would sell for enough to pay for the costs of the building and the fences standing upon it. The reasons are not far to seek. To diversify industry, the manufacturers in the <coughs> state of Massachusetts have been so favored at the expense of agriculture that the natives of Shrewsbury have been enticed away from their homes and their occupations that their fathers entered many years ago to enter into industrial shops. Um, so we're now going to the tannery to work. <laughs> We're not playing at the farm anymore. We're going to the tannery. So not a pound of sugar or rice can he buy without paying the favored growers of these necessities double prices. Protection, every, protection for everybody else's products and free trade against his have ground the Shrewsbury farmer like the upper and nether millstones. And no wonder he wants to sell his farm and nobody wants to buy it. So by 1889, these people were already starting to hurt. Now, I don't have meeting minutes to go that far, so I don't know what their discussions were at that point. But it's quite obvious that at this point, before 1900, we were already struggling to keep and maintain large farms in this town and that the products that they had been selling, and I mean products that they had been growing and selling since the early 1700s are being mass produced, easy, easily more easily accessible, out of the hands cost-wise of what a lot of people were. 
So I'm sure that most of the farms that were able to stay in, in function um, were once back, we're going back from, say, late 1800s back to 1720, feeding our families. So, um, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I, I was born here, I mean, not born here, but I mean, I, we lived here in town in the 50s, and my brother and I were off of School Street, and we still, there were still apple orchards down by Dean Park entrance. There were still cows, because we used to go down and pester them. So there were still small little notches here and there that were still functioning. But by the early, by the late 1800s, early 1900s, we had lost almost all our farms, except for the dairy farms, which seemed to be able to make a profit and produce. Um, like I said in the beginning, the Shrewsbury eventually joined with the Worcester Agricultural Fairgrounds, or agricultural societies. They had big fairgrounds. They had massive agricultural fairs then. And it was the same thing as we were having here, but now we were including tons of towns. So they were huge. So they were, <clears throat> we were seeing different kinds of agriculture and different kinds of breeds of stocks and stuff like that. And it said the Massachusetts Agricultural Fairs Association, it was just like part, they were all over the country. And Massachusetts had become a long way into developing these fairs and, and putting agriculture still as a forefront and part of the, the birth of, of especially, say, Massachusetts and, and, you know, town and local states around. So, so that is, I've probably bored you to death now. <laughs> Even though I find things entertaining, not everybody does. I have discovered that. What I find entertaining, not everybody else does. So that is basically, it gives you some idea of what they were doing in their meetings, but it also gives you a pretty good idea of how it came up, how it leveled off, and how it went down.